there are a barrage of articles about the hatred directed towards Muslims. A term called Islamophobia has come into common usage to describe this phenomenon. Although curiously, at least in an official capacity, there doesn't seem to exist terms such as Christophobia, Hindophobia, Buddhophobia, and so on, only Islamophobia. It must be said from the outset, no person should be attacked or hated on the basis of their religion or any other factors, and this includes Muslims. But what is not often explained in these articles is that the hate is often as a reaction to the Muslim stroke Islam's own hate and behaviour towards non-Muslims. The term phobia suffixed to Islam means an irrational fear of Islam. Indeed, there is genuine reason to be fearful, or if not fearful, certainly cautious about Islam, but it is not irrational, as there is a direct correlation to the Muslims' own intolerance, violence, aggression, refusing to integrate, regressive practices, sense of superiority as espoused by its scriptures and so on. All this has an impact on the behaviour of the Muslim, which in turn upsets many people. Also, what is not explained in these articles is Islam, stroke Muslims, are taught to hate anything non-Islamic, and by extension, non-Muslims. This is a teaching that emanates from the core of Islam's basic principles. Whenever an act of terrorism or atrocity is committed against non-Muslims, a question often asked is, why do they hate us? The real answer lies in the doctrine of the religion. For example, in this article it explains after Omar Mateen massacred civilians at a nightclub in Orlando on 12th of June 2016. In the next issue of their magazine Dabik, ISIS responded with an article titled Why We Hate You. It reads, quote, Muslims undoubtedly hate liberalist sodomites as does anyone else with any shred of their fitra inborn human nature still intact. An act of terrorism? Most definitely, Muslims have been commanded to terrorize the disbelieving enemies of Allah." End quote. The Quranic verse relating to terrorizing non-Muslims was explained in the previous video. The article then goes on to provide an interpretation of the Islamic theological concept of al-wara wal bara which all Muslims must believe in. This is the idea that it is logically impossible to love Allah without hating what he stands against, namely the disbelievers. According to this line of thinking, the only relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims is that of active enmity or passive hatred. Calling people Islamophobic is often done to play the victim card, deflect from the real issues and to stifle any debate or criticism of Islam. The person is slurred with the label Islamophobe, but in reality the so-called Islamophobe is more often than not a non-Muslim who happens to know more about Islam than they really ought to know, or certainly more than the Muslim who labels them Islamophobe. This is because the term Islamophobia is banded around on anything and anybody who stands up to the regressive practices of Islam and denounces their oppressive characteristics, such as the farce that there are documented cases of acts of terrorism and violence supported and celebrated by Muslims, intolerance and hideous practices advocated from their very own scriptures, whether it be pedophilia, misogyny, slavery, etc. Yet the term Islamophobe is cried out when people point these things out. The reality is Islam and Muslims have been psychologically chained to a raft of appalling double standards, a position that only their feelings are important and nobody else's is worth anything. The irony is that the religion of Islam, and by extension the people who follow it, are taught to have hatred towards non-Muslims, and the general hatred of all things non-Islamic is enshrined and practiced by Muslims. This will be evidenced in this video.
The doctrine of love and hate is critical for understanding the Muslim psyche, especially the so-called extremists' worldview in relation to their perception of disbelievers. Although they are labelled extremists, they are actually ones who are practising what the religion really teaches. They hate because their scripture says they must. It must be said, while the Muslim majority do not share this belief, that does not mean it is not part of Islam, as the concept of al-wara wal bara is supported by the Quran and Hadith literature. The concept is found in the following Quranic verses. As an example, in 551, it says Jews and Christians should not be taken as allies, and in 923, one's own family cannot be taken as allies if they are non-believers. Commentating on Quran 923, Tafsir al-Tabari says it means not to take your family as friends if they are not Muslims. Should anyone do this, they have gone against the command of Allah. So when people wonder why Islam and its followers are often associated with the hate of anything that is non-Islamic, it should not come as a coincidence that the concept of hating for the sake of Islam is from this essential concept called al-wara wal-bara. The term al-wara comes from the Arabic to mean to be close, support, help, guide, defend, etc. It is derived from the Quranic term awliya, which is translated as supporters, friends, here circled in blue. The second part of al-bara means to hate, disavow, disown, reject, disassociate, have enmity, etc. It is also a term derived from the Quran tabara found in Quran 9, 114, which will be looked at next. The concept of al-wara wal bara is commonly translated as loyalty and disavowal. It signifies loving and hating for the sake of Allah. So it has Quranic and Hadith precedence, as these ideas come from the Quran itself, such as 3.28 and other places. For example, in Tafsir al-Tabari on Quran 3.28, after quoting prominent Muslims, says it means, quote, Allah has prevented the Muslims from being friendly to the disbelievers and to be close to them, except if they are in minority, then to be superficially nice to them. He explains that this is the meaning of taqa, from which the word taqiya comes from. It is a kind of divine sanction to be hypocritical or lying, which is allowed in Islam. The concept of disavowing family members if they are not Muslims are plenty. In Tabari, in his commentary for Quran 9.113-4, cites numerous hadiths saying even if it is a family member, but if they are not believers, then to disown them. They are to be considered enemies of Allah, and their destination is hell. He mentions in the case of Muhammad, the verse is said to have been in relation to Abu Talib, his own uncle, who looked after him at his most vulnerable stages of his life, protected him and cared for him when many did not. Other scholars have said it was about his own mother, who was not a Muslim. As the verse is connected to Abraham and his father, who was not a monotheist, therefore an enemy of Allah. So in all these cases, the disbelievers are the enemies of Allah, going on to say when it becomes apparent they are enemies of Allah by virtue of their disbelief, then to disavow them. This is where the term al-bara comes from, circled in red. In this source, it translates the word as washed his hands from his own father. Not only are Muslims supposed to sever ties with their families, if they are not Muslim. In Tafsir Ibn Kathir on Quran 58.22 says these verses were revealed when Ubaidah killed his father on the day of Badr, when Abu Bakr killed his son Abdul Rahman, when Musab ibn Umair killed his brother Ubaid ibn Umair of Badr, about Umar when he killed his relative of Badr, about Hamza and Ali, Ubaidah al Haris killing Utbah, Shaybah, Walid bin Utbah respectively. 
There are documented cases of Muslims killing their own families even today if they are not Muslim. Many commentaries corroborate these accounts in Asbab al Nuzul it says about 58-22 this verse was revealed about Abu Baidah ibn al-Jarrah who killed his father Abdullah at the Battle of Uhud. It was revealed about Abu Bakr who challenged his own son for a duel at the Battle of Badr. He said, O Messenger of Allah, let me be among the first group of martyrs. The Messenger of Allah, Allah bless him and give him peace, said to him, Preserve yourself for us. O Abu Bakr, do you not know that you are to me like my hearing and sight? The verse was also revealed about Musab ibn Umar who killed his brother Umar ibn Umar at the Battle of Uhud. And it was also revealed about Umar who killed his uncle al As ibn Hisham ibn al Mughayra at the Battle of Badr. And it was also revealed about Ali, Hamza al Ubaida who killed Utba ibn Rabia, Shaiba ibn Rabia, and Al Walid ibn Utba respectively at the Battle of Badr. Hence his words, even though they may be their fathers or their sons or their brethren or their clan. Next, here are a few hadiths to illustrate the doctrine of hate and love in Islam as explained by Muhammad himself in Sunan Abu Dawood 4582 Muhammad said, Best of the actions is to love for the sake of Allah and to hate for the sake of Allah. This is put into action when Muhammad tells Muslims not to greet the Jews and Christians and to force them on the narrowest path found in Sahih Muslim. Notice the Hadith does not specify any group of Jews or Christians. It says the Jews and the Christians in a generic manner. The grammatical and natural reading of the Hadith implies any Jew or Christian are treated in this way, and indeed they have been ever since. Also taken from Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim in Riyadh Salihin 387, it says, Messenger of Allah said, When Allah loves a slave, he calls Gabriel and says, I love so and so, so love him. And then Gabriel loves him. Then Gabriel announces in the heavens, saying, Allah loves so and so, so love him. Then the inhabitants of the heavens also love him. And the people on earth love him. And when Allah hates a slave, he calls Gabriel and says, I hate so and so, so hate him. Then Gabriel also hates him. He then announces amongst the inhabitants of heavens, Verily Allah hates so and so, so you also hate him. Thus, they also start to hate him. Then he becomes the object of hatred on the earth also. Many prominent Muslim scholars talk about the importance of hatred for the sake of Islam. One such person is Ibn Taymiyyah a major figure in Islam. He is quoted in the study by a Muslim scholar saying the Muslim is to love only what Allah loves and hate what he hates. They are only to ally with Muslims and oppose disbelievers, even if they are the closest of kin. As the concept has Quranic and Hadith precedence, numerous scholars have considered it as one of the basic principles of Islam, affirming its monotheism. Quoted in the source Islam question and answers, taking his evidence from the Quran and Hadith, Ibn Baz, who was at the time Saudi Arabia's Grand Mufti, explained the concept as Al Wala means to love the Muslims and help them, and Al Bara means to hate the non Muslim and be their enemy. Notice that the Muslim does not hate the non Muslim because of their foreign policy, race, colonialism, their wealth or anything else. It is because Islam tells them to hate non-Muslims due to them being a non-Muslim. These and other issues are only an excuse, a pretext or ruse that the Muslim uses for the hate which is already embedded in the faith. In other words, they hate regardless of these external issues. They hate people because they are not a Muslim.
other prominent scholars such as Sheikh Saleh Munajjid, who is the main contributor to the popular Islam Q&A website. He says in Fatwa number 11793, with regard to non-Muslims, the Muslim should disavow himself of them and he should not feel any love in his heart towards them. He then quotes Quran chapter 60. In Islam Q&A, Fatwa number 47322, he writes, The belief in al-wala, wal-bara, loyalty and friendship versus disavowal and enmity is one of the most basic principles of Islam. End quote. Sheikh Uthaymin, who was a major scholar until his death, and whose works are still highly influential, talks about the concept. He again quotes Quran chapter 60, saying it means disavowal and loyalty only to Allah, citing the example of Abraham's disavowal towards his father by virtue of him not being a monotheist. But there will be enmity and animosity, hatred forever between them, quoting the same Quranic passages. Sheikh Saleh al Fawzan the most senior Islamic scholar in Saudi Arabia today is quoted as saying Allah has commanded Muslims to regard disbelievers as enemies, to hate and disavow them. There are videos of him saying Muslims cannot be friends with Jews and Shias, for example. Liberal minded scholars and apologists, especially those educated in the West or live in the West, perhaps as a frontage to the non-Muslim audience and to their predominantly liberal Muslim audience will often deny the importance of al-wala wal-bara and say Islam only teaches love to non-Muslims. One such example is Yasir Qadi, another is Norman Ali Khan. However, in refutation to them and others like them, in this source called Bakr Publications, questioning those who say Islam does not teach hatred against non-Muslims, Sheikh Abdurrahman Muhyiddin, former professor at the Islamic University of Medina and Mufti of Muhammad's mosque is quoted as saying this is misguided and whoever says this does not know about Islam. He says this is a liberalist philosophy and the devil speaks on their tongue, going on to say Islam has hatred for disbelievers and disbelief must be hated and he explains the reasons why the links to the sources are below however there are modern scholars living in the west who are not afraid to say it as it is sheikh ahmed musa jibril is one such example he is a populist preacher giving a lecture in a recorded video as posted on youtube he explains to love allah one must hate non-believers. Another one is New York-based cleric Mufti Muhammad ibn Munir says Muslims should hate non-Muslims as this is what Islam teaches. But for saying these things, both these individuals are labelled as extremists. But they are actually only preaching what Islam really teaches, unlike the fake and watered-down version of Islam that liberal Muslim scholars and apologists preach. The links to both the videos are in the description. So in conclusion, Muslims who find that their religion is viewed negatively should have the good grace to stop hiding behind the slanderous word Islamophobia. They should show a little honesty and admit that the religion is the problem. It's a religion that does not preach universal brotherhood, but universal Islamic domination. And there's a huge difference between the two. It preaches hatred and violence in its holy scriptures, not just once or twice, but again and again. It shows open contempt for others' beliefs and values as it defines itself in aggressively divisive terms between Muslims and non-Muslims who must be conquered and converted. It urges Muslims not to take non-Muslims as friends, to force their social values into the lives of those around them and to shove their religion down everyone's throat as soon as they are strong enough to do so. Islamic values are aggressively non-negotiable 
which essentially offers a choice between submission and permanent conflict. It is ultra-sensitive to the point of paranoia, and many of its followers regard violence as a legitimate response to any criticism. When they are in a weak form, a fake form of Islam, one that is lovable, tolerant, peaceable brand of Islam is often portrayed, especially aimed at people in the West. Thankfully, most people are not fooled, and every time the word Islamophobia is used, the divide gets wider and the mistrust grows. Far from being oppressed as a minority, they are aggressive, and when they are in the majority, they quickly become enthusiastic oppressors driven by a delusion of divinely ordained supremacism. Islamophobia is a discredited term and is so provably statistically false that anyone still using it shows the depth of their own dishonesty and their absolute contempt for the intelligence of everyone else. There is good reason to be fearful and cautious about Islam, but it is not based on an irrational fear, as the term Islamophobia implies. Further, as Islam and per extension Muslims hate or are told to hate non-Muslims, there should be a term for Islam's phobia and hatred towards non-Muslims and its own fear of the truth. This is proved as a real phenomenon and is proved from its core sources, scholars and is indeed enacted by Muslims every day. So there should be official terms such as non-Muslimophobia or truthophobia rather than the fictitious Islamophobia. Thank you.